This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 287, recorded on April 25th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. It's a treat to be back with you. Getting spring weather out there? Yeah, we've got some color, the forsythia and other flowering trees, so that's lovely. And it's a graduation weekend, so wow. coming up. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. And you guys have Chamber of Commerce weather? We, we do indeed. The, they've rolled out the red carpet. Y'all come, as they say. Indeed. Well, up here in New York, it's kind of, uh, it's nice. It's a little chilly still. We have uh, 14C and cloudy today, but certainly winter is behind us. So today we have for you a snippet and a paper, and maybe someday we should mix it up and do the paper first. Yeah. <laughs> Just to get people confused. And, I and, don't know. Uh, the appetizer, snippet as an appetizer. Yeah, it's an like appetizer. You're absolutely right. Okay, Michael, you're up with a snippet. All right. Today's paper comes from Trends in Microbiology. It's going to be published in May of 2023, and it's entitled Environmental Integrons, the Dark Side of the Integron World. Ooh. And as we couldn't take everyone to Paris in April, uh, we're at least going to France, where this paper is from the Université de Pau, which is close to the French border, French and Spanish border along the Pyrenees. And it's by Eva Sandoval Quintana, Beatrice Loga, and Christine Cagnon. And so before we dive into the paper per se, I'd like to define the term we're going to be talking a lot about today, integron, so that we're all on the same page. And this is really going to be an exercise in genetic gymnastics which normally doesn't lend itself well to audio, but we're going to try our best. Integrons are an assembly platform that incorporate exogenous open reading frames, which in this case, that they, as they might say here in Charleston, it's genetic material from off. And off is a, a pejorative phrase that Charlestonians referred to from for people who come to Charleston and don't leave, like me. So I'm considered from off. So I'm an exogenous piece of genetic information here in Charleston. So exogenous in this case means it's DNA that's not native to the host. But what's remarkable about integrons is that this genetic element then converts the genes from off, if you will, into functional genes by ensuring their correct expression by site-specific, generally RECA independent recombination into discrete units of circularized DNA known as simply gene cassettes. They were first identified uh, by virtue of their important role in the spread of antibiotic resistance genes. And I'll drop into the show notes a review of integrons that was published about 17 years ago by Mizell in Nature Microbiology Reviews. I originally thought of integrons as super-duper transposons, which are nothing more than mobile DNA elements that have a phenotype associated with them that can then relocate themselves within the genetic material of the host. But integrons are a bit bigger. Again, let me say that again. Integrons take open reading frames and then via this RECA independent manner perform site-specific recombination with the host genetic information, which then results in the generation of a functional series of genes or simply a gene capable of expression by that host. And all integrons are operationally defined by three key components. And these components are necessary for the capture first 
of the foreign or exogenous uh, genetic information, an integrase gene, one uh, that recognizes or the integrase gene encodes a specific type of integrase belonging to uh, the tyrosine recombination family, a primary recombination site within the integron, which is commonly abbreviated as at I for I for integron, and, in, and then there's the at C site, which happens to be in the chromosome. Those of you who are lambda aficionados will know that as the phage attachment site or the lambda insertion site in, in the chromosome. So it helped me to think about it that way, since after all, this is only an audio podcast. And then we have an outward oriented promoter from the, from the chromosome, that's abbreviated PC, that directs transcription of the capture genes. And then, of course, there's the promoter that's embedded into the integron that's from off that gets the designation PI. So the integron encoded integrases can then recombine these discrete units of circularized DNA or these genetic cassettes again in a rec A independent manner. And they effectively add these cassettes to the genetic makeup of the host. And in the case of the clinic, what we get out of that is often an antibiotic resistance trait, which really adds a selective advantage to that clinical microbe, because oftentimes physicians prescribe antibiotics that kill bacteria. And of course, you know, that's what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And in this case, having the antibiotic resistance cassette certainly makes the microbe that got the integron much more fit, able to withstand the antibiotic insult. So uh, all of this is elegantly described in the author's first figure. There's only two figures in this paper, and they're really easy to help you understand the gymnastics. And the integron integrase is the thing, the gene that comes from the integron, and it catalyzed the insertion of free circular genetic cassettes by recombination between the at integron site in the integron and the chromosome. And I think of this as Campbell insertion from the old phage days after Alan Campbell. Vincent is now grinning since we don't show. And I I happen to have the honor of meeting Alan Campbell a a couple of times. And I sang his praises each time I met him for, for figuring out this remarkable recombination type activity. And then there's these promoter elements that we've already talked about. But it's the gene cassettes that are expressed at differential levels according to their proximity to the promoters. You get one from the host, you get one from the integron. So one question I often ask of my graduate students on exams is how would you show Or how do you know that the statement is correct? Or simply, what experiments would you do? And I was trained in the style after John Beckwith, where we love beta-galactosidase fusion cassettes. So I would do a scriptional or translational fusion, excuse me, where I would drop the beta-gal gene in frame and see how much beta-gal I would make, or today we would do it with um, GFP and all those other remarkable things simply because of the, uh, you don't have to do an enzyme assay, you just simply use a fluorimeter. So why bring this concept of genetic gymnastics to TWIM? Uh, Well, for many years, the importance of integrons has been relegated to the world of infectious diseases simply due to their role in spreading antibiotic resistance 
in clinical settings, thereby mediating bacterial resistance and antibiotic stewardship and all of the things that medical students love to hate. But today, there's an emerging interest in these genetic elements, given that it's likely integrons were originally environmental in origin, and it's only because we became clever enough to detect an antibiotic phenotype that we began to discover them simply because we, you know, wanted to understand antibiotic resistance. And so these elements are becoming more important because of their environmental origin, their capacity to generate, if you will, phenotypic knowledge to others and their on-demand adaptive ability because, again, if you impose the right selective pressure on an environment, things change. The microbes respond to the environment based on the demands of the local environment. And of course, if you're applying for an SBIR, you always invoke the potential use for biotechnology. So as this mini review offers, studies conducted outside clinical settings have revealed what we know about the diversity of integrons is merely the tip of the genetic iceberg, simply because for many years, we've been stuck in a rut, only thinking about the clinic and the integrons in how they're spreading antibiotic resistance. Integrons, again, occur in many ecosystems worldwide, from the highly polluted to the pristine and in a wide range of bacterial taxa. In the three main clinical classes of integrons, and the way integrons are classified is based principally on the recognition of the integrase sequence. In the environment, all bets are off. While there are some environmental integrases that belong to the three known clinical classes, in nature, most of the integron integrase sequences are sufficiently divergent to constitute hundreds of additional classes. Well, if there are hundreds of integron types in nature, what then is the canonical phenotype or hallmark or the thing that integrons do. We know in the clinic, it's antibiotic resistance. But what do you look for from the environment? So what do you, what do you think is the principal selection factor? Well, you can decide. Well, some of you may have been thinking, it's broad functional diversity. So you're effectively, you get to decide the selective pressure you're going to impose and then see whether or not the community can adapt. And in fact, this has been recently demonstrated where nearly 45,000 open reading frames encoding over 27,000 proteins were recovered simply from a set of only 48 soil samples. Wow. And then and then 13,397 unique integron associated genes were uncovered by mining 260 gigabyte gigabases not gigabytes gigabases of metagenomic data so, so, so Michael did you say there were 13,000 integrons yes. discovered in these just integron associated dozen, genes yes and just a couple dozen soil samples yep wow that's a huge toolbox. We, have, we haven't even gone to the oceans and begun to explore the oceans. We haven't begun to explore the deep subsurface. We, we did a gold mining paper on TWIM a few episodes back, you know, going down miles deep. So in addition to this broad diversity, the mere acquisition, loss, and rearrangement of genetic cassettes can generate countless new integron cassettes, which takes us back to the doctrine of microbial infallibility. And uh, we talked about that at in TWIM 81, so I'll drop that uh, recent paper about microbial infallibility into the show notes again. And in this mini review, the authors introduce us to the term 
environmental integrons, which they are defining simply as integrons originating in a natural environment that have never been impacted by antibiotic selective pressures from a clinical setting. There's, of course, no way of knowing if they've been impacted in nature because, well, of course, most certainly they have, right? Microbes yeah. live in communities and they compete for resources and antibiotics are the one way they do it. So what I found also interesting is that their definition of environmental integron is the basis of the original or clinical integron. And the way I imagine this is consider integrons as being the whole of the Lego block. You know, it effectively allows you to add the Lego pieces to make whatever thing you want to make, whether it's a Star Wars fighter jet or whether it's Abraham Lincoln sitting on the Lincoln Memorial. You you just get these building blocks and the integron is effectively our hands that are assembling the unique Lego pieces. And they're just using the integrase, the at sequence to effectively assemble this in a Lego like manner. And they do this beautifully in their second figure where they illustrate using different colored arrows. And that's where I got the notion of assembling these Lego blocks and Their figure is relatively straightforward to interpret and imagine how these environmental integrons add the plasticity to the environmental microbial or the microbial community in general to be able to deal with anything. So what is nature's intent for these bacterial and integrons? Are they simply nature's way of ensuring that life can respond to any selective pressure. Uh, We already know that clinical integrons have the ability to effectively demonstrate a rapid adaptation to the selective pressures imposed by antibiotics. It's simply adapt or die. So thinking about what's going on in the environment, they're responding to these perturbations, whether they be changes in temperature, like we're experiencing now on planet Earth with climate change, whether it's the change in the dissolved CO2 and our ocean seawaters that are effectively changing the uh, pH balance or the carbonate balance of oceans, whether it's to hydrocarbon degradation. Each of these integrons can literally just result in select out microbes that have the ability to adapt to this environment. Now, the authors point out it's been hypothesized that the detection of gene cassette homologs in various parts of the world may be the result of dispersal and selection of these adaptive integrons in locations experience in similar environmental stressors. And why I picked this paper is I thought this would be a great way to introduce concepts of metabolism to students, the One Health uh, initiative that's been going on that basically argues we're all in this planet, spaceship Earth together, and we have to all cooperate and the integrons are our way of assuring that the microbial world, which is responsible for most of the things going on on the planet, can deal with these perturbations. A key concept with One Health, um, it, to my mind, is that there's flow of microbes and microbial genes throughout the environment, throughout microbial populations, and then invariably um, throughout the human population as well. So knowing that there is this huge diversity of these integrons out in the natural world just says, you know, we've got to stay on our toes because (laughs) it's inevitable that we're going to come in contact with them and some will interfere with clinical treatments. Yeah. So, so why this paper on TWIM? Well, with summer research season approaching, I thought I would challenge our listeners to think about investigating environmental integrants, either 
in the wet lab itself or doing this in silico, beginning to take some of the clinical integrase sequences and sort of mixing them up or looking for the tyrosine integrase family of integrases to see whether or not you can spot those. And there's been a lot of environmental isolates that haven't even been grown or even been named that have been deposited in publicly available databases and ask the following questions. Do environmental integrons share molecular mechanisms, expression, regulation? You can look at the pro-owner with the clinical integrons. To what extent do they contribute to the genomic plasticity and to the evolution of natural communities? And you'll get the idea why I dropped the microbial infallibility paper into the notes after that statement. And this is the real one that I think that anyone concerned about the microbiome needs to be thinking. Do they alter community structure and subsequently ecosystem function, which is likely a critical question that I'm sure that we'll be exploring on TWIM 1000, <laughs> which, my, which by my calculation is going to be at approximately the year 2052. When those folks will be leading TWIM 1000 will be discussing the significance of a, the introduction of a probiotic member to the human race's gut. So I hope this has been, a, a, as Michelle said, an appetizer to get us thinking about the next paper, which I think is, is really going to dovetail in nicely to this. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to Bring us into the world of salmonella. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the paper I've selected is titled Salmonella Invasion is Controlled by Competition Among Intestinal Chemical Signals. And it is by Remy Chahardi, Paulina Bittar, Hanara Chapman, and Craig Altier. And they work at Cornell University in Ithaca. And this became available online um, through MBIO earlier in April. So we're going to talk about salmonella, which many of us have experienced. Um, it can cause a really um, unpleasant food poisoning, typically self-limiting, but um, can you know trigger diarrhea because this organism is able to actually get inside cells that line our intestine and um, trigger inflammation, which we experience as, as uh, diarrhea. So what's amazing about this paper is they demonstrate that salmonella can gauge where it is along the track from our mouth to our anus by sensing the ratio of fatty acids to a simple carboxylic acid, formic acid. So to begin this, let's um, just review a little anatomy. Um, our stomach is linked to our small intestine, which has three different regions, the most distal of which is called the ileum. And that ileum, we know to be really rich in um, what are called Peyer's patches, cells that are collections of, of tissue that are very good at sampling the contents of the intestine and delivering that information to immune cells that, that lie under the Peyer's patch. And it's in the Peyer's patch that um, salmonella can invade. After the ileum, the intestine links to the large intestine, which goes through the cecum, the colon, and then the rectum and, and out back into the environment. So what's amazing is that um, we've known for a couple decades now um, from work initially with um, Brad Jones and Nafisa Gori in Stan Falco's lab that salmonella can enter M cells, as I mentioned, which again are um, rich in the ileum of the um, small intestine. And then Years later, Craig Altier, the senior author on this paper, his group learned that formic acid also stimulates invasion. And so they're focused now on what's the implication of that and how does that affect Salmonella's whole virulent strategy. So before going into the paper, let's um, just refresh on what formic acid is. It's the smallest and simplest carboxylic acid. It's basically a carbon that's got 
a um, double bond to oxygen, and then a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen group. So it's small, it's simple. And if you've been bit by fire ants, it's what stings you when the huh. fire ant bites you. Wow. But forget <laughs> about that because in this paper, formic acid is a hero. <laughs> okay. So okay. then, then um, formic acid can be more complex and be a component of fatty acids. And these come in short versions and long versions. And they're basically a carboxylic acid that is linked to a chain of of carbons and then ends in a methyl group. So those are the fatty acids that we'll be talking about in the paper. And fatty acids are very abundant in the more distal parts of our intestine, in the in the large intestine. Whereas formic acid, this very small, simple molecule, um, is abundant in, as we'll see, in the ileum. So that kind of the junction between the small intestine and the large intestine. So why are we focusing on formic acid? Craig Altier in 2008, um, his group published that formic acid um, stimulates invasion of salmonella in the gut, but they didn't know how, how this worked. So that's really the focus of this paper. And the trainee that took this up, Rima, was really intrigued by the link between metabolites in our intestine and the pathogenesis strategy of salmonella. So they also took advantage of um, a large literature on not only the anatomy in the gut, but also um, understanding of the whole regulon that allows salmonella to go from a replication mode to one where they're instead invading. They can elaborate a type 3 secretion system and deliver a lot of virulence factors that then equip salmonella to alter the biology of the M cell and to get inside, survive, and um, begin to infect the intestinal epithelium. And in particular, we're, we're going to um, think about regulator of that invasion pathway called HIL-D. And the punchline will be that HIL-D is able to sense, uh, am I in an environment that's rich in formic acid, or instead, is it rich in short and long-chain fatty acids? And that exposure to either formic acid and or fatty acids dictates whether salmonella is going to be in a replication mode or instead an invasion mode. So the first experiment uh, that they did to ask how is formic acid stimulating invasion took advantage of a nice uh, reporter. They know that the HIL-A gene is important in this invasion regulon and they fuse the HIL-A promoter to a luminescence operon, the Lux operon. This way they could quantify luminescence as a readout of HIL-A expression. So what they did is first um, in figure 1C, let's uh, focus on, is they exposed salmonella that had this HIL-A Lux reporter to either formic acid, and they saw a, a large increase in expression of the, this HIL-A regulator, if instead they exposed it to these long or short chain fatty acids, they saw low expression, repressed expression of this HIL-A invasion gene. But if they incubated it first with formic acid and then the fatty acid, the HIL-A gene was turned on. So in doing a couple of um, experiments where they varied the order of whether they, the salmonella was first exposed to a fatty acid pool or instead was first exposed to formic acid, they developed the model that formic acid is, by some mechanism, triggering the whole invasion program, but fatty acids, on the other hand, are inhibiting this invasion program. So they wanted to look at this in more detail, and first they wanted to see, is this realistic that the, that the amount of either formic acid or fatty acid really was dictating the invasion program of salmonella? And to do that, um, to their credit, they um, used a mouse model, and they actually isolated the contents of the late part of the small intestine, the ileum and also the cecum and colon of the large intestine, and they measured formic acid. And what they saw, and this is in figure 1E, is that there is uh, on the order of 40 millimolar formic acid in the ileum, whereas it drops more than uh, tenfold in the more distant um, in large intestine. So clearly formic acid was abundant in the ileum, which again is where 
the salmonella field knew that salmon that salmonella could invade um, these pyre patches. So they uh, were of course motivated to continue studying this and uh, wanted to know whether the order of exposure to the fatty acid versus the formic acid made a difference. And in fact, what they found is if you first expose salmonella to large quantities of fatty acids that are abundant further along in the large intestine and then treated them with formic acid, nothing happened. There was no invasion. On the other hand, if you instead expose them on the more natural route that they would see as they pass from the stomach to the anus, so first 40 millimolar of formic acid and then expose them to fatty acids, now um, the salmonella program, invasion program, was activated. So formic acid can definitely induce the invasion pathway and if it is um, seen first by salmonella, it can continue to activate invasion despite the presence of these um, more uh, repressor fatty acids. So this um, gave them a picture that formic acid is, because it's abundant in the um, ileum of the small intestine, it provides a spatial and a temporal clue to salmonella as they're passing um, from the stomach into our uh, lower GI tract. That is so wild because, you know, we we tell our students that E. coli is a mixed acid fermenter. Mm-hmm. And one of the acids that E. coli makes is formic acid. Mm. Yeah. So E. coli is helping this process along, which is why salmonella is always a pathogen. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is wild. This is wild. Yeah, so you're you're saying that in the ileum, the reason that there would be so much formic acid is because yeah. it's abundant in enterics yeah. like E. coli. Yeah, because of the mixed acid fermentation, that is a natural process of good old E. coli. That's right. you know a predominant player in our what, guts. What's being fermented? Uh, sugars, sugars, sugars. So it 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 E. coli makes hydrogen. It makes formic acid. It makes uh, ethanolamine. It makes all, and ethanolamine is another important metabolite for salmonella. So E. coli is is sort of cooking its own goose, so to speak. Mm. <laughs> so next, they wanted to know whether the the formic acid that was inducing their invasion program was working outside of the salmonella cell, or did it have to get inside the cell in order to do its magic? So here, they took advantage of again their knowledge of salmonella biology, and they were able to make a strain that lacked the channel that allows formic acid to flow from the outside into the cytoplasm. So this is the gene um, FOCA, F-O-C-A, FOCA. So they repeated their experiment using these nice uh, luminescence reporters, and they compared wild-type salmonella to salmonella that lacked this um, channel the formic acid channel. And that's shown in figure 2A. And what they saw very clearly is that you absolutely, salmonella absolutely needs this formic acid channel in order to respond to exogenous formic acid and induce the invasion um, gene expression. So from there, they wanted to know, okay, is it formic acid itself, itself, or is it metabolite derived from formic acid? So again, they were able to use their their knowledge of um, salmonella metabolism and also the genes that are responsible. They knew that um, salmonella had three different formate dehydrogenases that could convert formic acid into other derivatives. And they asked, does conversion by one of these three enzymes generate the product that works the magic and turns on the invasion pathway? Or are those formate dehydrogenase enzymes dispensable? So in figure 2B, we see they compared um, wild-type expression of the invasion gene to a mutant that lacked all three of the formate dehydrogenases. And what we see is that not only did mutation of the dehydrogenases not block the stimulation by formic acid, it actually enhanced the um, stimulation of the pathway. So clearly, it was formic acid itself, because if you block its metabolism, 
the cell is getting now a higher signal and, and turning on the invasion gene even um, more robustly. So again, they're zeroing in then, it's really formic acid that is getting inside the cell. And now they wanna know, okay, what is formic acid interacting with? And is it affecting binding to HILD, this master regulator that they had previously identified? So for this experiment, they um, used a really lovely um, assay, um, an ELISA assay it's called, where they could take plastic plates that have many different wells and they could coat the bottom of the plates with the fatty acid of their choice. So they could try um, a short chain fatty acid versus long chain fatty acids, different structures of fatty acids. Once they prepared the plates, then they um, incubated them with his tagged hill d protein and asked whether it could bind to the um, fatty acid and if so was that binding affected by the presence or absence of formic acid so by doing this assay using the plates and an elisa it allowed them to actually do many different concentrations of the um, key components and actually measure dissociation constants and all of that is displayed um, beautifully in figure 3a, where we see very clearly that in the presence of um, formic acid, then HILD is not able to bind to the plate and stick. But in the absence of formic acid, the um, HILD protein can interact with fatty acids. So this was consistent with what they had learned previously, but they also were able to um, calculate the uh, dissociation constant and come up with um, very convincing evidence that HILD, this activator of the, re of the invasion pathway, could be bound by either fatty acids or by HILD, and who bound depended on um, mm -hmm. who, um, who HILD saw first. So the next experiment they wanted to do was to look more directly at HILD binding and ask whether the presence or absence of formic acid was affecting binding of HILD to its target. So we see that in figure 4a, where in the presence of formic acid, the HILD protein can bind to its target the promoter and retard um, progression of that DNA fragment through an agarose gel. In contrast, if you incubate with just the um, fatty acids, now the binding is not able to occur, so the DNA promoter fragment migrates very quickly. And if you incubate first from formic acid and then come with the fatty acid, again, you see tight binding of HILD to the DNA. So they demonstrated then that this was um, acting at the level of the HILD regulator's ability to bind to its promoter, which then uh, triggers the whole invasion uh, regulon cascade. Now, it was also known that the stability of this HILD regulator was also affected by its binding to fatty acids. So they Again, we're very um, logical and testing each of these um, components of, of the known biology. And they did this by um, doing a, um, a time course experiment where they looked at the stability of the HILD protein after it was exposed to first fatty acids. And that we see on the right-hand panel in figure five. And it shows that um, incubation with a fatty acid really just shortens the lifespan, the half-life of the um, HILD protein down to less than a half hour. Whereas if they incubate with formic acid, now HILD sticks around for hours, as long as four hours. So again, they're building this model that in the presence of formic acid, you not only can bind to HILD, but you also stabilize the protein, which is critical because it's HILD again that triggers this whole invasion program. And that's important because you have to take in consideration the transit time when you ingest food to the time it exits. Mm. And so the fact that this causes it to hang around enables more salmonella to get in. And so it, it's really 
uh, a pretty neat system because you, you look at these time points and you say, well, so, but until you think about the inoculum, which is coming in via food, hmm. it really drives the story home. Yeah, and that's actually um, a beautiful setup for their next experiment. They wanted to really test this in the setting of an animal who's ingesting salmonella through the oral route and then asking, does the ability to take formic acid across, have it flow across the membrane and get into the cell where it can bind HIL-D, is that really affecting expression of this invasion pathway in the gut of a mouse? So what they did is um, beautifully illustrated with a schematic in figure six, I believe it is. It is, um, 6A. Yeah, where they first um, did an oral, oral ino inoculation of the um, their strain, where mm -hmm. they're going to be able to look at a terminal gene in this invasion cascade called SICK-A. They were able to measure its expression um, because they'd fused the SICK-A promoter to a GFP reporter. So they fed these uh, the mice these salmonella expressing their invasion GFP reporter. Then they waited 90 minutes for that meal to flow through the stomach, through the ileum, into the large intestine. They euthanized the mice, and then they dissected out and obtained the contents of the ileum and asked how much GFP, how much of the invasion um, program is being expressed in the population. And they found that fully 45% of the salmonella in the ileum had activated their invasion um, pathway as judged by this GFP fusion. In contrast, when they used their strain of salmonella that could not import the folic acid because it lacked the channel coded by folk A. Now the fluorescence was down equal to the autofluorescence that um, measured from salmonella that didn't even have the GFP reporter. So clearly as salmonella is passing through the um, GI tract of a mouse, it is responding to formic acid and activating um, strongly its virulence program. And that's important because, um, as the authors point out, for salmonella to trigger this invasion program is a big economic cost. They've got to make this type 3 secretion system, this big needle. They release, have to produce and release a lot of um, virulence factors. So it's an expensive um, commitment to the invasion pathway. So it would be um, it would reduce the fitness of salmonella if, as they were passing through the stomach and the um, whole small intestine and large intestine if they were constitutively expressing this invasion pathway. Instead, we find beautifully that it is where formic acid is high, again, 40 millimolar in the ileum of their mice, um, that's when this program gets activated. They do their thing, they can get into the M cell. Once they pass out of that area, they shut that program down and they can focus their resources on just multiplying, making more progeny in the large intestine that can then pass out into the environment and await um, their next host. So I thought this was a really lovely um, answer to the question, why is it that salmonella prefers to invade in the ileum? Why is it there that we see um, activation of this virulence protein, a uh, virulence program? And it's simply responding to <laughs> signals in our gut, formic acid, this very small carboxylic acid versus the larger, more complex, uh, short and long chain fatty acids. Very elegant. Take advantage of the environment, you know? Yeah. That's what evolution is about. So I want to tell you, story from Remy. This is very cool. Remy Chowdhury is the first author, and she, she did her master's and PhD in uh, biochemistry at the University of Calcutta, uh, and she worked on Salmonella as Typhi and for a postdoc joined Craig Altier's lab uh, at Cornell, which is where this work was done. Uh, and she says she decided to be a scientist when she was 10 years old. Cool. <laughs> she thought scientists were the coolest detectives and she, st I still do, she says. After high school, I wanted to major in microbiology, but I was very bad at remembering all the names and genus and species. 
which were a big part of the course. So I went with biochemistry. I went with proteins and reaction mechanisms. And I decided that's what I want to do the rest of my life. It's great. <laughs> you know what I do? I don't, I don't think my students need to memorize names. So I just give it to them on the test. I, I, we yeah, have I agree. unlock code. I give them the names and then why memorize trivia I, that I, is I, meaningless. So here's a cool story of how um, the story that Michelle told you had, had evolved. She was working on how the virulence master regulator of Salmonella H. Hilde is regulated by intestinal fatty acids. These combine to HILD disrupt its ability to bind DNA and be a transcription factor. So intestinal fatty acids can repress salmonella invasion gene expression by preventing HILD activation. And she says, I was at a lab meeting showing a model of the putative binding pocket of HILD uh, uh, where uh, fatty acids attach. Craig looked at me and asked, how do you think fatty acids interact with HILD? And she says, me, by their carboxylate domain, I think. Craig, what do you think will happen to salmonella invasion gene expression if a small fatty acid binds to this pocket? Me, invasion gene expression will stop. Craig, what is the smallest fatty acid? Me, propionic acid, three carbons. Craig, think smaller. <laughs> Me, formic acid? That's just one carbon carboxylate group, but that is a metabolite. Craig, what do you think will happen to invasion gene expression if formic acid binds to this pocket? Me, I think formic acid can bind to this pocket as it's just one carbon, but maybe that binding can prevent other fatty acids from accessing the pocket. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Craig, what about invasion gene expression? Think bigger, Remy. Don't be stuck in your binding pocket. Just kidding. He is great. Me, well, that's like a biochemist. They, they right. get yeah. stuck in their binding pockets. Me. Okay, I think if salmonella is pre-exposed to formic acid, this metabolite will stick in Hilde's fatty acid binding pocket, which will prevent other fatty acids from interacting with Hilde. Therefore, salmonella invasion gene expression will be on despite the presence of repressive fatty acids. Craig, bingo! Now think about physiological implications. Me, eyes glowing in excitement. I imagine salmonella navigating down the intestinal tract in the distal ileum and encounters this burst of formic acid. This metabolite enters the cytoplasm of salmonella, binds to HILD, preventing fatty acids from getting there and binding. This will keep HILD activated, and thus invasion gene expression will go on despite the presence of fatty acids. Maybe that's why distal ileum is the preferred place for salmonella invasion because of high concentrations of formic acid. We had this hypothesis in 2020. The project was challenging experimentally, especially the gene expression assays with formic acid and the EMSA with the formic acid. But we have a great team, hardworking, supportive. This would not have been possible without their support, especially Paulina. Craig is just an amazing mentor. Thanks for picking our paper. Hope you enjoy reading it as much as we enjoyed working on it. So, Remy, that was just great. I really appreciate the dialogue. I love it. <laughs> And, and it's a great summary of her it is. work. It is. I mean, it it lays it out beautifully, and it teaches so much about the complexity that's going on in the small intestine. We're we're just not this tube. There's specific niches for the microbes that are in various portions of our digestive tract. Sure. And sure. It's it's really quite remarkable. And what I loved about the paper too is they they explored other possibilities. Well, maybe formic mm -hmm. acid is acting yep. from the outside. Well, maybe formic acid, it's a metabolite of formic acid. And they systematically applied genetics, ruled it out. It's nope, it's formic acid. It's key. Yeah. And, yeah. I, I also think, you know, this formic acid, obviously there are other organisms going into the gut viruses, for example. Mm -hmm. Many, many viruses will be inactivated by this formic acid. So in a way, E. coli is protecting us, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have evolved to, to to have that protection, although some viruses can pass through. Poliovirus is completely resistant to this formic acid. It has an incredible capsid that gets it through wow. it, and it goes into even beyond the ileum into the into the colon. It's small intestine, I guess, in the colon, right? So, well, doesn't polio like the Peyer's patches as well? We think it does, yes, but no yeah. one really has proven that, and and no one will. But yes, Peyer's patches, right where that formic acid is. Yeah. Yeah, they're sampling and getting uh, pulled in. They're, 
but mm-hmm. yeah, Pyrus patches seem to be a major place, but, but the, the formic acid is there and polio does not mind whatsoever. So it's really remarkable. Yeah. And many other viruses uh, don't mind either. So it's an, as Michael said, it's a really interesting place. With lots of interactions going on and, you know, it's not a, it's not binary by any means. It's just huge. And this is just the beginning of understanding what's going on there. And remember the other byproduct of E. coli's uh, formate dehydrogenase, in addition to formic acid, is hydrogen gas, yeah, which feeds many other bacteria in those niches. That's right. So it, it's really pretty wild. You can't just consider it in a, a if you will, in a two. Not isolate. Nothing is an isolation. No, right? nothing yeah. is an isolation. Although in this particular case, they could. Um, take the purified, everything. purified components and show yeah. that uh, so they the take DNA a re- binding was affected by yeah. fatty acids versus formic well, acid. Well, this paper really addresses how do you know and how do you show? And they executed perfectly. And how do you yeah. know and how they, do you they show? Did the, they did the reductionist approach. They took yes. apart. Very and it worked. Mm-hmm. It worked. It doesn't always work, right? Sometimes no. you take apart the components and it, and there's too many interactions to do that. But this right. is a very nice, very nice story. Well done. Beautiful genetics. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michelle. That is TWIM 287 uh, marching towards 300. 1,000. Well, we'll take it 100 at a time. Let's do it. Th- we'll do take three, it 100 three, at a time. 300. We'll, we'll have to start doing TWIM like multiple times a week if we're going to live to see 1,000. Well, even okay. TWIM, if we do TWIM twice a week, it's going to be another 10 years to, to get 1,000. Right, right, so I'm, right. I'm going for that. You know, I'm I'm going to stay healthy. For You're at least pushing three. forward. I hope that after reaching 1,000, you give yourself a, a break, take a holiday and yeah, we well, t- he did. He didn't post Daniel's clinical update until yeah. Monday. Yeah, we took a, a oh we took two a days. Good. Yeah. <laughs> but I <laughs> like doing this day Michelle. holiday. It's good for me. If I took a holiday, I wouldn't know what to do. So I love that's that. true. Uh, that is Twim two eighty seven. The show notes are at microbe tv slash Twim. And if you have any questions or comments, you could send them to the Twim at microbe tv. And if you enjoy our work, we we would enjoy your financial support microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Michelle. My pleasure. And Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.